Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Professor Anru Deidri Singh, Chairperson of the Women's Health Committee of Sri Lanka Medical Association. I warmly welcome all of you in the SLMA Auditorium, as well as those who are joining with us online for the annual lecture of the Women's Health Committee 2023. The topic of this lecture today is hypertension in women impact on well-being. According to present data, out of 22 million persons, 52% are females. Further, life expectancy of females in Sri Lanka, averagely, about 79.5 years, whereas males, it is 73 years. Hypertension, which is a common non-communicable disease in both males and females, is seen in middle age as well as elderly. Therefore, understanding hypertension, especially in women, for their well-being is very important. Nationally and internationally, Hypertension Awareness Month is celebrated in May. So, as members of the women's Health Committee, we strongly, we strongly believe, believe that we that need we to need educate, educate the medical, medical community, community as well as the public, public in this important disease. Professor Uday Ralapanava, Professor in Medicine, attached to Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya, is here today to do this duty as a member of our team. While thanking While Professor Alapanava for agreeing to do this annual lecture, I invite my friend and my colleague, Dr. Deepa Gunasekar, the convener of the Women's Health Committee, to introduce Professor Ralapanava. Over to you, Deepa. Thank you, Professor Anuruddhi. And Professor Anuruddhi Ediri Singh, Chairperson, Women's Health Committee, Sri Lanka Medical Association, ladies and gentlemen. It's with great pleasure that I introduce our esteemed speaker for today's talk, Professor Udaya Ralapanava. Professor Ralapanava is a renowned figure in the field of medicine with a distinguished focus on hypertension and cardiology. He has obtained his MBBS from the University of Peradeniya in 1996, followed by an MD from the University of Colombo, 2003. Currently serving as a professor and head of the Department of Medicine at University of Peradeniya, as well as a, a consultant physician at the teaching hospital in Peradeniya, Professor Alapanava has showcased exemplary leadership and mag made magnificent contribution to medical knowledge and patient care. Through his guidance, numerous medical professionals and students have been shaped, shaping in future of health care. As the immediate past president of Sri Lanka Hypertension Society and the former director of the Hypertension Research Center in Peradeniya, Professor Alapanava has demonstrated unwavering commitment to advance hypertension research and improving its management. His impressive list of fellowship include MRCP UK, FRCP London, FRCP Edinburgh, FCCP, ISHF, and FNASSL. Further exemplify his dedication to staying at the forefront of the field. Professor Alpanava's contribution have been widely recognized and published in numerous scholarly, scholarly articles, influential textbooks, and notable presentations. He was the orator of the Professor K. Rajasurya Memorial Oration in 2018. Today, we are fortunate to have Professor Alapanava share his wealth of knowledge with us. Whether you are a medical professional, patient, or simply interested in understanding this prevalent condition, Professor Alapanava's expertise undoubtedly leave lasting impact. Please join me in welcoming Professor Alapanava to the stage and let us eagerly await the invaluable, invaluable insight he is about to share. Over to Professor Alapanava. Thank you. Um, 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank SLMA and the Women's Subcommittee for inviting me for this uh, lecture. My thanks goes to Dr. Vinya Ariratna, and uh, especially my thanks goes to Professor Anruddhi Edirsinghe. Thank you, madam. And also Dr. Deepa Gunasekara. Uh, thank you, Deepa, for your kind word of introduction. And uh, so today I am here uh, at this memorable hall to share my knowledge on hypertension, particularly in relation to women and hypertension and the well-being related to women and hypertension. So as you know, the 17th of May is the World Hypertension Day. That is uh, last month. We celebrated this important day. And the month of May is called as May Measurement Month. The, during this whole month, the world, the population and the people who are interested in hypertension get together to increase the awareness uh, among the public about the high blood pressure. So hypertension can be considered as a disease as well as a risk factor. And they have shown the lowering blood pressure can reduce the stroke, coronary vein, cardiac failure and renal impairment. And it, it is important to note that high blood pressure is undiagnosed and undertreated in, even in the developed countries. Globally, 1.13 billion people are having high blood pressure. One in four men, as well as one in five women are having high blood pressure according to 2015 data. So important to notice the, this trend, it was earlier in the developed countries, now this trend is moving towards the developing countries. Countries like Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, the South Asian countries having very high incidence of uh, high blood pressure today. According to the Sri Lankan uh, figures, prevalence of hypertension in Sri Lanka is about 18.8 in male and 19.3 in female. You can see slightly higher the preponderance of hypertension in female. Other important things, only about 22% of the people with hypertension are adequately controlled. So that's another important factor because though they are diagnosed, they are not uh, treating properly. So the importance of treating hypertension, I can summarize by this slide. If your blood pressure rising from 120-80 to 140-90, the risk of dying from stroke of heart, heart attack increased by fourfold. If this uh, the blood pressure rise 120-80 to 180-110, by, by this risk is multiplied by eight times. So you can understand why we need to treat this high blood pressure. When you go to our physiology knowledge, the, you know the blood pressure depends on blood volume, vascular resistance, and heart stroke volume. So blood pressure blood equal to cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. Any factor which can increase cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance can increase your blood pressure. So cardiac output again depends on heart rate and stroke volume. So these are the factors which determine high blood pressure. So the, when you consider regulation of the blood pressure, the acute response is by sympathetic nervous system. Then the most important uh, the regulatory mechanism is running angiotensin system. And then the, again, there's another the, the supportive uh, pathway that's the aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone pathway. So this we learn in our physiology and very important pathway to remember because most of the blood pressure control as well as treatment targets, we are mainly aiming at training angiotensin aldosterone system. So if somebody asks, why do you get hypertension? About 90% of the people with hypertension, there is no cause. So we call, uh, call it as a essential hypertension. About 10% of the people, there is a cause. So these are the causes I have listed down. The common causes for the secondary hypertension are renal parenchymal disease, renal vascular disease, primary aldosteronism, obstructive sleep apnea, and drug or alcohol induced. So the uncommon causes are, I have listed down, the preocomocytoma, Cushin syndrome, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, which is very common in our female population, aortic coarctation, and etc. So those are the uncommon secondary causes. 
So the other important thing in hypertension is a risk factor. Now we all experience this kind of risk factor and that lead to high blood pressure. So one risk factor, one of the most important risk factor in this area is this, this region is the sodium consumption. So in Sri Lanka and the South Asian countries, we consume large amount of uh, the salt, which is uh, more than the recommended daily dose. And this is one area we have to stress, especially our female people, our women, our mothers, not to add salt to your rice when you are cooking rice, not to add. So this is one area that we have to highlight to reduce blood pressure in our region. Very cost effective. And physical inactivity and stress. You know, all of us are under stress today and that's one of the major risk factors for developing high blood pressure. Overweight obesity, excess alcohol consumption. Fortunately, our female are not taking too much alcohol, but now we can see some trend they are taking, but not too much. And the, the reduced uh, so potassium, magnesium, and calcium in diet also contribute to development of hypertension. So how do they present to you? Most of the time, they are asymptomatic. So how do they diagnose? Usually, during the routine checkup. We are, they are coming, people are coming to us for some, uh, to get the treatment for some other illness, for example, fever or so body pain. We check the blood pressure, then we can identify the blood pressure. So, rarely they can present with a headache and visual disturbances like symptoms, and sometimes they can present with the features of endogen damage. That is too late. So, for example, if someone is coming to hospital with a stroke, if that is the time you are diagnosing high blood pressure, that is too late. If someone is coming to hospital with a heart attack, that time if you diagnose high blood pressure, that is too late. So having said that, so how do you diagnose high blood pressure? Do we have any investigation? Answer is no. So it is by measuring your blood pressure. So simple way, but very important, you, do, uh, you have to check the blood pressure very accurately. Otherwise, you are unnecessarily labeling the patient is having high blood pressure. If you label as a high blood pressure, that will be a lifelong diagnosis. So what the recommendation given by ISH 2020, patients should sit on a chair in a quiet room and uh, keeping the, his legs on the ground. And you should not talk when you are checking the blood pressure. Hand should rest on the table. And you have to take the re-reading re re of the blood pressure one minute apart. Then the last two readings, that's the second and third average will take as a blood pressure. So the, then some people, you know, when they come to doctor, you get the, the high blood pressure. Especially female people, they are prone to get this white coat effect. So to overcome this white coat effect, we recommend to do the home blood pressure measurement. You know, nowadays, a lot of people, they do have the, the blood pressure apparatus at home. So always remember, you have to take the you have to buy the recommended blood pressure apparatus and check it, uh, the, you have to accurately check the blood pressure. Other way of checking the blood pressure and diagnosing high blood pressure is a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure measurement. It is recommended for people with a high blood pressure due to white coat effect and apparent drug resistant people, episodic hypertensive patient and people on antihypertensive who get in symptoms, you recommend this uh, ambulatory blood pressure measurement. So, so then, then we check the blood pressure. The blood pressure. Then how do you define your blood pressure? blood pressure? Is there a difference between male and female? Answer is no. You know, there are so many organizations giving various cutoff value for the blood pressure. I would like to choose 2020 ISH guideline. So according to that, this is how you categorize blood pressure. Your blood pressure is said to be normal when the systolic blood pressure less than 130 and the diastolic blood pressure less than 85. And uh, as in diabetes, you know diabetes, there is a condition called pre-diabetic. Similarly, in high blood pressure also, there is a condition called high normal blood pressure. When your blood pressure ranges from 130 to 139 and or 85 to 89. When your pressure is going above 140 90, we call you are having high blood pressure. In high blood pressure category, there are two grades, grade 1 and grade 2. So this classification, this is common to both male and female patient with high blood pressure. So there is no difference when you are categorizing patient uh, according to the sex, depending on this uh, ca classification and these levels. So depending on your blood pressure reading, when you are checking at home or at clinic, your pressure can be labeled as normal tensu if the both instances blood pressure is normal. 
and the, you, you are having sustained blood pressure when the both home blood pressure as well as clinic blood pressure is high, you call it as a sustained hypertension. There's an interesting uh, phenomenon. Some people, their home blood pressure is high, but the, when they come to our clinic, their blood pressure is normal. That entity is called mass hypertension. And the, as I said earlier, white coat hypertension is when you come to the clinic, your blood pressure is high, home blood pressure is normal. So with that introduction, ladies and gentlemen, so I would like to tell you, or I would like to call hypertension as a silent killer. But this was the earlier, the, the, the most people thought hypertension is a silent killer. But in uh, 2019, Professor Angela, she presented the paper, and there she described hypertension in women, no silent lady killer. I will tell it later because most of the young and uh, the young and middle-aged female with high blood pressure they do show symptoms. Then, according to Professor Angela, especially the hypertension in female is not a silent killer. So the way, uh, so now we'll talk about hypertension in women. So the at a young age, high blood pressure is more often present in men than in women. But this reverses gradually after age of 50, after the menopause, women tend to have high blood pressure more than male. Hypertension in women develop more arterial stiffness, heart failure, and preserve ejection fraction, atrial fibrillation, and dementia at the old age compared to hypertension in men. So comparatively, these diseases are commoner in female. Aortic aneurysm also tends to rupture at a smaller size in female compared to male. And only half of all patients with hypertension are currently treated appropriately, and this accounts even more for women than for men. So the, accordingly, the women are under-treated compared to men. According to, to the Nanny's survey, which was done in the United States during the 2011 to 2014, they have shown 85.7 people having high blood pressure, of that more than 50% were women. So even those countries, women show more tendency to develop high blood pressure. Despite the magnitude of societal impact, awareness, treatment, and the control of hypertension remain suboptimal in women. So that's another problem. The, compared to male, the, the, the evidence and the values for the female are lacking. Guidelines for the prevention, detection, evaluation, and management of high blood pressure in adults is comprehensive. There is limited discussion on sex and gender differences as it is related to hypertension. So the, the, when you uh, do the literature survey, the data related to hypertension in women also lacking. So the, what are the female specific risk factors and premature hypertension? Premenstrual migraine is related to high family risk of cardiovascular disease and a higher susceptibility to inflammatory and the development of premature hypertension. You know, our population, a lot of people are having migraine, especially female, they are having high risk of developing hypertension in adult life. At an old age, again, the recurrent and persistent headache in a woman is a risk factor for develop hypertension in the later life. In the Women's Health Initiative WHI study, it was found that recurrent miscarriage was associated with a high risk of hypertension. And hypertensive pregnancy disorder, preeclampsia in particular, have been acknowledged as an important risk factor in women leading to the twofold increased risk of ischemic heart disease and fourfold uh, risk of developing high blood pressure. So uh, you have to understand here the recurrent miscarriages as well as PIH or pregnancy induced hypertension has a high uh, person who developed those as is having high risk of developing high blood pressure in later. After menopause, which occur around age of 50, there is a steep rise of the hypertension rate seen in the female. Menopause is associated with a twofold increase of risk of hypertension with prevalence of 75% in postmenopausal women in US. So after menopause, so about 75% of the people having high blood pressure in United States. So as I said, female is not a silent killer. Hypertension in female is not a silent killer. What are the evidence? The hypertension in young and the middle-aged women is often symptomatic. They can present with tight, nagging and often, nagging and often continuous chest pain at rest. 
they can present pain may, which may radiate to the jaw, left arm, shoulder blades, like ischemia. Straight related chest pain with or without radiation. Again, another thing we can see in the young people. people. Hot flushes, severe setting and day, daytime or nighttime setting is another symptom with the female with hypertension. Palpitation, tachycardia, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation can be the presentation of hypertension in female. Intermittent fluid retention, causing edema around the ankle, hands and eye will be the another presentation. And headache, blurring vision, uh, also common presentation among female with hypertension. So what is the pathophysiology in female with hypertension? Rates of hypertension increases after menopause when the estrogen level falls. So you have to understand there is a significant role played by estrogen protecting female from hypertension. Estrogen may be have a vascular protective effect in premenopausal women. Estrogen plays a role in endothelial homeostasis through its action on vascular, vascular cardiomyocyte and brain receptors. So that's how it, carry, uh, it, it gives this beneficial effect for the female, young female. Estrogen causes endothelial vasodilatation. Nowadays, we believe the endothelial dysfunction is a main cause of hypertension. And it is mainly by upregulation of the nitric oxide pathway and inhibition of, or downregulation of sympathetic and renin angiotensin system as well as endothelium production. Estrogen reduce oxidative stress. So you can see that there are a lot of beneficial effects by estrogen in premenopausal female. But contrast to that, they have shown addition of exogenous estrogen, that is an exogenous estrogen therapy after menopause has neutral effect on blood pressure. So this beneficial effect mainly by endogenous, endothe uh, endogenous the estrogen. And there is no impact of exogenous estrogen on the cardiovascular outcome. Exogenous estrogen used with an oral contraceptive pills in premenopausal women can cause even high blood pressure. So, so it is interesting. The endogenous the estrogen, the before menopause, having a lot of beneficial effect reducing the blood pressure. But after menopause, you can get a high blood pressure, and the, even the exogenous estrogen having no that beneficial effect. So the, how about progesterone? That's one of the main female hormones. Studies on the effect of progesterone are limited. So we don't have enough data. No increased risk of hypertension or short-term cardiometabolic outcome with progesterone-only contraceptive pills. And preeclampsia and the gestational hypertension are also associated with the increased risk of postpartum hypertension and long-term cardiovascular disease. Younger women with estrogen imbalance such as premature ovarian insufficiency, polycystic ovarian disorder, and infertility may have an increased risk of developing high blood pressure. So if somebody is in imbalance due to some other causes, also at risk of developing high blood pressure even they are young. So the pathophysiology, continuation, recent advances in the basic science research have identified several possible mechanisms responsible for the observed sex difference in hypertension. So there's obviously there's a difference between the male and female uh, regarding the hypertension. So the, you know the hypertension is a chronic inflammatory disease. Now that is how we the, consider it as a chronic inflammatory disease. And the body immune system has a significant role in uh, the developing high blood pressure. So they have shown the greater anti-inflammatory inflammatory immune profile in female during hypertension may act as a compensated mechanism to limit increase in blood pressure compared to male. So the body response in the female, especially immune response, can reduce the immune response and reduce the blood pressure, especially in female population. So this is an interesting area which we can do some research. The, the role of immune system and now the, the, the new evidence, the, there are new evidence that the body immune mechanism is playing the role in development of the hypertension. So the sex differences in detection, evaluation, and management of hypertension. All the women and men with the hypertension have a similar prevalence of cardiovascular disease. Their risk factor profile is different. Hypertensive men have more traditional cardiovascular risk factors like smoking and dyslipidemia. Those are the, the traditional risk factors. Contrast to that, 
High principle women, they are having more non-traditional risk factors like abdominal obesity and the kidney diseases. So those are the difference when you compare male and female hypertensive population. And the perimenopausal and menopausal women may have more variability in ambulatory blood pressure measurement. So that's another observation. Postmenopausal women more like to do exhibit a non-dipping pattern of blood pressure. That is very important thing. You know, this dipping is a, the, the normal phenomenon which is a beneficial for cardiovascular diseases. If non-dipping is, their blood pressure is not dipping in the, uh, in the night time. So that ha they have shown that will lead to increased risk of development of the hypertension and cardiovascular diseases. So the treatment targets are not sex specific. Nowadays, all the guidelines, they are giving common target for both male and female. The same blood pressure goal should be applied for the men and women based on the sprint and meta-analysis data. So now we can see the difference between the blood pressure patho uh, development pathophysiology among men and female, but still the, our data mainly for the both sexes, common, uh, common guidelines are given. The high weight uh, trial, which enrolled about 60% of women, including the 2,326 uh, women over 60, 80 years, they have shown treating high blood pressure in all people also, they carry the good prognosis. So even the people above 80, you have to treat according to the guidelines, even they are all frail female. Another important aspect in the female hypertension is a pregnancy-related high blood pressure. As you are aware, 1 in 10 women with high blood uh, during the pregnancy, 1 in 10 pregnant mother will develop high blood pressure. During the pregnancy, the blood pressure, if it develops before 20 weeks, we call it as chronic hypertension. If developed after 20 weeks of gestation, you can categorize preeclampsia or eclampsia, gestational hypertension, and chronic hypertension patient with superimposed preeclampsia. Discussion about the uh, pregnancy-related hypertension is beyond my, the scope of this lecture, so I am not going to discuss that in detail. Then we'll move to the treatment. The specific pharmacological treatment recommendation for hypertension in fem female there is currently no substantial evidence for differential, differential effect of antihypertensive therapy based on sex or gender. So we use common guidelines. Comorbidities in women may influence the choice of antihypertensive treatment in some instances. For example, in the pregnancy-related hypertension, you can't use some drugs you use for the normal people. And diuretic therapy has an interesting role. The diuretic therapy can reduce urinary calcium excretion which have positive effect on the prevention of bone loss and osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. So that's the one beneficial effect for the postmenopausal women. And one meta-analysis suggests that calcium channel blockers may be more beneficial in women than AC inhibitors for stroke prevention. So according to that study, the, for the stroke prevention in female, using the calcium channel blocker is better than AC inhibitors. So other thing is, women may also experience more antihypertensive medication side defects than men. So you know, most of the antihypertensive treatment are having side defects. Women shows more side defects than men. So as recent guidelines shows, the combination of two or three medications in moderate doses is often more effective in women. That is even the latest guideline, ISA 2022, also recommend use the multiple drugs, combination of multiple drugs or combined pills when you are treating your patient with hypertension that applies for the female with hypertension also. When the free retention and the chest pain dominate, a combination of AC inhibitors so receptor blockers with diltezam is often very effective for the female hypertension. In perimenopausal women with hypertension and fast rise in heart rate, you can use AC inhibitors and beta blockers in combination, which will give some additional benefit for the patient. And women with uh, severe sub, uh, the postmenopausal symptom, and uh, the, those kind of patients, use of uh, dosperinone, that's a synthetic progesterone with mineral corticoid property, with 17 beta estradiol has shown reduced blood pressure as well as blood pressure and the symptomatic benefit for the patient. So these are some specific aspect of the uh, hypertension in female. 
And how about non-pharmacological intervention for hypertension? You know, the, when you are treating high blood pressure patient, there are non-pharmacological approach and the pharmacological approach. So now we are going to discuss non-pharmacological intervention for female with hypertension. Salt restriction has theoretically benefit for the women given the possible upregulation of RAs after menopause. You know, after menopause, training angiotensin system up, upgrading. So when you are using uh, use the salt restriction, it is a beneficial effect. Weight loss strategy. You know, our people, the, especially women, are more obese compared to men. So they are, they have shown the real beneficial effect if you are losing weight, especially you get good weight in your adult life. It is very beneficial if you can lose the weight. It can reduce the blood pressure. So the weight loss, in addition to dietary interventions such as DASH diet, has been studied in women and showed incremental benefit on lowering the blood pressure. So these are very beneficial effects for the female with high blood pressure. How about alcohol? Fortunately, our country, the, as I said earlier, females don't drink too much. They, they recommend the no more than one standard alcohol drink per day for the women. So you know that if you are using more than that, that's a risk factor for hypertension. The role of cardiovascular fitness in, is in improving hemodynamics and long-term cardiovascular outcome have been well established. The combined aerobic and resistant exercise can reduce the arterial stiffness. So always encourage your female pa patient to do aerobic exercises which can reduce the arterial stiffness and reduce the blood pressure. So other important aspect in uh, female is a cultural barriers. You know, fortunately, it is not seen in our country as such, but some countries, you can see the, the people, female are not allowed to come for even for the, any health care facility. So the cultural specific to the barriers to the health care, we have to identify and we have to address those issues when you are treating female with hypertension. Social and environmental factors that influence behaviors and impact risk factor for cardiovascular diseases are different women. So yeah, some communities, always male dominate, they can come to or, or any, any healthcare facility or anything, but female are suppressed. Community characteristics including lack of access to timely and quality healthcare, low education and income levels and poor social support all impact women's health and their high blood pressure control. Great understanding of how sex and gender influence the prevalence, diagnosis, and management of hypertension need to be given. So that is some priority the, the, that is seen in some Asian countries and African countries. So those are the areas we have to address when you are considering the hypertension management. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to summarize the highlights of the lecture I have done so far. So when you consider the pathophysiology of the hypertension and female, so the vascular protective effect of estrogen plays the, the great role in a female with uh, the female they are, with regard to their blood pressure control. After menopause, the, the change of estrogen, they are high susceptibility to develop blood pressure. And pregnancy-related vascular risk factors like preeclampsia, gestational hypertension is a special situation in female. And stress, uh, state uh, estrogen imbalance such as polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome, premature ovarian failure, also another important is instances where young people can develop high blood pressure. And regarding the estrogen, uh, role of progesterone, data are lacking. When you consider the epidemiology, lower hypertension rates in uh, premenopausal women compared to male, two-fold increased risk of hypertension with uh, menopause, and about 80% of the women over 75 having high blood pressure. You can see the importance of problem and the, the gravity of the problem. And when you are considering screening and diagnosis uh, uh, in female hypertension, hypertension women, women have more non-traditional cardiovascular risk factors, as I said, the abdominal obesity-like condition, and more variability of ambulatory blood pressure measurement in the postmenopausal women. And postmenopausal women more likely to exhibit non-dipping pattern of blood pressure, which is very important risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease. And treatment about the pharmacological treatment, diuretic therapy, as I said, may be more beneficial in postmenopausal women with osteoporosis. Calcium channel blocker more beneficial in women for stroke prevention. Women may experience more antihypertensive side effects. 
So non pharmacological treatment summary, short restriction may beneficial women giving possible upregulation of RA system after menopause, weight loss after middle uh, life weight gain is beneficial, DASH diet plus weight loss may have incremental benefit for the blood pressure lowering, no more than one standard alcohol per day, and combined aerobic and resistant exercises are recommended for the female. So now we move to the impact of well-being. So what is well-being? Well-being is difficult to define precisely, but the state of state encompasses the ability to perform one's normal occupation, household, housework, hobbies, and leisure interests without any interference. Enjoyment of eating, drinking, personal relation, social contacts, and sex also powerful contributors. So if you can maintain this in a good condition, we can say that person well-being is maintained. So what is the effect of hypertension on a female well-being? So medical treatment, as I mentioned, or intervention that has an adverse effect on any of these activities can be justified only if it has un unmistakable compensatory benefit for the patient. So now we are using uh, the treatment, we are advising to them to follow intervention, the non pharmacological intervention. So those things should give the benefit for the patient without damaging their well-being. So as a healthcare providers, we should try our best to maintain their well-being, otherwise they won't continue their medication, unless uh, they can get a complication. So when you concentrate on this slide, so you can see this hypertension, as I said, it's a real risk factor for developing left ventricular hypertrophy. For example, if somebody is having uncontrolled blood pressure for a long period, developing left ventricular hypertrophy, what's the next effect? They can go into heart failure and ischemia, so they can get a myocardial infarction. Just imagine if somebody develops heart failure, what will happen to their quality of life? They are frequently coming to hospital with repeated admission, they can't carry out their day-to-day -day activities. So it is very important to identify this unseen killer, the hypertension, to prevent developing heart failure, prevent developing ischemia and the myocardial infarction. Again, think, if somebody develops stroke because uh, you haven't treated the hypertension, you haven't identified the hypertension, so if person develops high blood pressure, that is a big effect for the family, society, country. So, so that is the importance of identifying this hypertension to maintain person well-being. And similarly, the, it can affect your eyes and cause in blindness. It can damage your the peripheral vessels, causing gangrene of the legs. It can damage uh, your kidney. You know, the one of the common cause for kidney disease is a hypertension. So if you concentrate on this side, and if you tell your person or patient, the male or female, this is why you have to take the medication. This is why you have to concentrate on this disease. That is why we are giving this medication. I think they will realize what is the importance of uh, taking medication or lifestyle changes. So if we can prevent these complications, I think one that's a one way we can maintain their well-being. So the responsibility on us as well as patient and as a government and a society and the ministry all are having come, uh, responsibility to educate the people regarding this dreaded side effects and the complication. We have seen the absence from the work, even after diagnosis of hypertension. There is no indication to give medical leave if somebody is having high blood pressure, so that is not an excuse for absence from the work. And anti treatment all have side effects, as I mentioned earlier, and sometimes even non-drug treatment such as low salt, high fiber, low fat diet may poorly tolerated. You know, from the birth and the very early st uh, stage of our life, we used to taste salt, you know, one, one amount of salt. And we don't even, we don't like to reduce that amount. So if you recommend the people, so they don't have the, the good taste, so that can also affect the quality of life. So we have to balance the risk benefit and educate our people. So always better to discuss, as I said, the, the slide I shown, that kind of approach is better them to understand the gravity and why we should take the medication. So then what are the other pro problems? The some drugs cause side effects, for example, beta blockers, they can, it can cause fatigue, 
cold extremities, bronchus spasm, exacerbation of intermittent claudication, vivid dreams. So those can affect the, the well-being of the person. And thiazide can cause glucose intolerance and high, uh, the high blood sugar, hypokalemia, and it can precipitate gout. AC inhibitors can cause cough, and calcium channel blockers can cause ankle edema. So our female patient taking this medication, they can come with these side effects which can affect their well-being. So the, according to the symptom questionnaire used by Bullpit, ETL, they have compared the patient with uh, on treatment and, non, and uh, people who are not on uh, high, not on hypertensive treatment. They have shown the the patient contain more of sleepiness, postural hypotension, dry mouth, nocturia, slow uh, slow working pace, impotence, and failure of ejaculation when they are taking this antihypertensive medication. All these can affect the, even the male uh, as well as female people well-being when you are treating the hypertension. Well-being may be adversely affected in hypertensive patients by the disease process and its complication, as I mentioned earlier. Other co concomitant diseases, especially depression, anxiety, and the treatment prescribed also can affect their well-being. So the, as I said, the pregnancy is a special situation. Complication of the pregnancy, uh, hypertension pregnancy can affect the mother as well as baby. You know the pregnancy induced hypertension is the main the killer of our the pregnant mothers. And uh, so that is one of the key area that we have to address when we are treating uh, mother with, uh, pregnant mother with high blood pressure. Mother can end up with the preeclampsia, eclampsia, stroke, and uh, sometimes they can uh, undergo the labor, the induction of the labor and placental absorption, and even the mother can die because of pregnancy-related hypertension. What will happen to fetus? They, it can get into IUGR or IUD. That also can lead to maternal distress and depression. So that's a different area that uh, always remember when you are talking about uh, maternal hypertension, you can't forget about the pregnancy-related hypertension. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you can understand what we are showing here. This is an iceberg. The hypertension problem in female, we haven't recognized correctly. So still more to do for the hypertension related to the female. And so far, all of us done a lot of work to treat and prevent hypertension in female as well as male. So we have done some studies. We have treated individually. What I urge you to come to under this umbrella. So this umbrella has formed you to get together. With that intention, we have reactivated the Sri Lanka Hypertension Society. Now it is an active body. And another milestone of hypertension management in our level is the establishment of Hypertension Research Center, University of Peradeniya. So it is an active body with the vision of achieving excellence in hypertension research in Sri Lanka. And it has a mission. The mission of HRCP is to become a center of excellence in hypertension research at national level by facilitating collaborative research work, supervising and collaborating research degrees, and fostering and dissemination of knowledge in the field of hypertension, which I am doing today at this uh, me memorable hall. My take home message. Hypertension is the most common modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular disease, the leading cause of death in women worldwide. Young women are protected from developing hypertension in part by endogenous estrogen. Currently, blood pressure treatment recommendations are similar to both for the both sexes. Further investigation into the idea of blood pressure target and associated clinical outcome are needed in women. So this is some area in even Sri Lanka we can do. Women are more likely to experience adverse effects associated with some classes of antihypertensive medication than male. A personalized approach is needed to choose the ideal therapy that effectively lower blood pressure, prevent cardiovascular disease, minimize adverse effects, and improves the well-being of women. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Professor Alapanava, for that excellent um, up-to-date knowledge, especially targeting women. Um, 
I would um, like to know if there's any uh, questions or clarifications, um, either audience or the our online um, members are having. Um, if so, I will give one or two minutes for that. Till the audience ask a question, can I ask you a question? Now, you said about endogenous um, uh, uh, estrogen. Uh, is the the best uh, part rather than taking um, uh, hormonal uh, exogenous estrogen, especially for menopausal women. Um, is there a mechanism, maybe through research which you have developed, to um, increase the endogenous part, which is, I know, with the age, it will reduce. Okay. But is there a way um, through the new knowledge uh, um, to increase that yeah. that part? The, thank you, madam. That's an interesting question. So that is uh, something like insulin, right? So the, now we know the our body, when the insulin is going down, so we can s replace uh, outside insulin uh, to carry out the function of the insulin. But in case of uh, this uh, hormone, the estrogen, the, for my knowledge, they haven't shown that anything indigenous thing. So the, what they say, the innate, you know, what your body produces, uh, the hormone, the estrogen, is giving this beneficial effect. But if you are replacing with the oral contraceptive, you don't see that effect. Contrary to that, you can get a the bad effect. For example, young person is getting oral contraceptive pill, there's a chance to develop hypertension. So that we'll say that person is not on oral contraceptive, but she is having endogenous insulin. That is a protective effect. But when you are giving the exogenous insulin, they, it can cause even the hypertension. So the, I think, uh, for my knowledge, knowledge, there is nothing, uh, they have produced anything similar to endogenous. Endogenous. Right. Thank you. Um, I think uh, this compared to insulin, insulin is a kind of a peptide chain. Right. So this can be produced in, uh, like, we can produce it, but it's uh, the, this estrogen hormones, are they are lipids. So then it's unable to produce as an endogenous uh, yeah. molecule. So that may be the reason it it's comes yeah. as a synthetic product always. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for that uh, well-delivered, uh, uh, well-prepared lecture. And uh, you said that the, for postmenopausal women, uh, you prefer diuretics. So what kind of diuretics uh, would you recommend, uh, either so thiazide or... Thiazide, it is, it is thiazide. Thiazide, you know, thiazide, thiazide. Uh, they have protective effect, bone protective effect. Thiazide is recommending. Okay, so thank you. Can I also ask a question, sir? Yes. So this uh, salt is uh, said to be a very important risk factor for this hypertension. So what is the recommended, we can say the public, what is the recommended amount of salt? If, uh, if you say roughly, that's a one teaspoon per day. So we are taking more than that. So the countries, all the South Asian countries, one of the main risk factors to develop high blood pressure is the salt. So I think that is something you can initiate, you know, the uh, to the, uh, you know, increase the awareness uh, about this salt. You know, our mothers, when they are cooking, they add some salt to the rice also, you yes. know, the rice pot, yeah. right? So because uh, other important thing, we have to, uh, you know, train our child, children, from the small age, not to take too much of salt. Because when you are used to take some amount of salt, you can't uh, drop that amount, yes. you know. Even yes. we don't like to uh, eat without salt, like, no? So I think the one thing is uh, addressing the mothers. I think you, you, uh, you know, your committee has a, can take that responsibility, right? Some education program about the salt and hypertension, right? Not only the salt can cause a lot of problems, no, even the hypertension can worsen because of the salt also. And if you can take some initiative, that's a good thing for the, you know, some, you can have some grandparents or some kind of thing 
to educate our main your target should be our mothers who are cooking right and uh, other thing is fast food you know all kind of fast food lot of salt right so that also we had to discourage because the, those are the main thing that uh, very cost effective you know just education the public rather when you reduce the salt intake you can reduce your blood pressure about 5 to 6 mm mercury sometimes even with the one tablet you can you can't get that benefit so that, that is something that we can address in our setup you know uh, thank you for that excellent lecture sir uh, thank you just thank another you. question um, this is regarding obesity in young people which is very prevalent in society now uh, so what um, have there been any studies about people who are on antihypertensives who are obese and who have had a drastic weight loss and uh, they could stop the antihypertensives altogether uh, in our Sri Lankan setting the studies on hypertension also not enough right so uh, as I mentioned our center hypertension research center we are doing some research right so to get the outcome and the, the result it will take some years right and uh, that's a good interventional study you know the, you know if you can uh, do some interventional study for the we'll say salt restriction and the dietary restriction and the improving the exercise that kind of thing those are interventional study those are the things that we have to target at the moment uh, in Sri Lankan setting we don't see that kind of study and especially there are nutritional consultant and registrars now you know the, 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 those are the field they can think about you know with collaborative with the physician and the so the nutritional registrars or re, senior registrars they can do that kind of study interventional studies now we know the dash is a western based diet no? so at peradini now we are planning to introduce uh, dash equivalent uh, diet for sri lankan people you know it is nothing new you know dash also we can we can prepare the similar kind of plate for our people with our available food products, right? So that kind of intervention we are planning uh, to do from the peer adhini for one of the uh, PhD students. Thank you. Any question online? Online. Yes. Um, one final question uh, or, or a, a suggestion as an expert in this area. Now, we have to tackle this uh, from what I understood from your lecture. Tackle this is you as South Asians, uh, the best way to tackle is you said reduce the salt, uh, um, salt intake as a population, as a population. Now, interventions has to start from, uh, according to you, from the childhood to the adulthood. But it, it comes with um, knowledge, attitude, uh, and um, skills. So we have to redo our, our um, way of uh, eating, way of using salt, way of cooking. So as the final message um, as an expert in hypertension mm, do you have you already started any research or as interventional studies um, about way of cooking uh, or, or uh, uh, things that where we can uh, sh mm, tell people mm, with with positive results, then then they would take up take up that. Are we having any large scale uh, uh, dialogue uh, in this area regarding uh, reducing salt? Because if you look at advertisements everywhere, high salt, salt uh, distributions, iodinized salts, everything is there. So where should we? aim our community in this uh, part? Yeah. Uh, I think that is a good uh, question as well as good uh, the suggestion. And uh, I think, uh, as I mentioned last month, it was a May measurement month, right? So our hypertension research center, we did a large number of activities to educate the, our medical officers as well as publics. 
So we did a lot of uh, public uh, you know, awareness program as well as some um, uh, television and the uh, broadcast uh, the activities, right? And those are the something that we have done to educate the public. But this message should go to the, our house, the kitchen. So that level we haven't done. So I think that way, the, I think public health uh, midwife, you know, that's the one thing, one person, I think, very good to carry this message to the, the kitchen. So if you can uh, give some kind of uh, educational leaflet, right, from your uh, women, uh, uh, the subcommittee, right? So educate uh, the, you know, like uh, cut down salt, don't add salt to your, uh, the, the, the cry spot, or that kind of thing, you know? So that message will go to kitchen. I think kitchen is the place where we distribute everything, you know, the all kind of salt added to food and everything. So those are the intervention, the, you know, it is an intervention, you know, you try to educate the family, the, the public, and then you may see those re results within maybe one, two months time. So I think the, I think SLMA, I think, I think you should take a, a the big role, uh, you know, the, because one of the main body in our country. And uh, so this is a big problem in South Asian country. The, uh, the, we are eating more than two, three times the, than the recommended amount. So that's a big problem. Even WHO has identified this problem. Right? Thank you, uh, Professor Alapanava, for that uh, lively uh, discussion and the, and the um, answering. And I think we are uh, almost uh, on time. Um, if any other person uh, who needs uh, uh, who wants any clarification from online audience? Um, online audience? No. Right. Uh, then uh, I would uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Deepak Gunasekara, uh, my um, co chair uh, in this committee, uh, to deliver the vote of thanks. Deepa, over to you. Valuable knowledge with us coming far away from Pera Denia. Then to the, all the audience who joined today, uh, physically as well as online, uh, with their busy schedules, uh, thank you very much all. And then finally to the Dr. India Ratna and all the SLMA staff members who help us to conduct this session uh, today. Thank you all. Good night, everyone.